The Intel Core i5 is typically suggested to be as high as you should go for a gaming PC and usually recommended as the sweet spot CPU for most. The reasons for this are a few. It can process four threads of information, similar to a Core i3, but instead of using two threads per core, each thread has its own dedicated core, which many games are more practically built for. So even though the Core i3 and i5 can process the same amount of threads, games tend to respond better to pure physical core threads. Which is also the reason why the i5 is recommended over a Core i7. A Core i7, at least in the normal desktop range, has four cores, but can run eight total threads thanks to simultaneous multi-threading. Again, games tend to underutilize the CPU's hyper-threading, which would lead to an exaggerated cost for the CPU without a realistic benefit for the gaming experience. This video today serves to analyze that claim. I've taken most of the recently released graphics cards and put them through their paces in several modern games to see just how close the i5-6500 can get to an i7 for gaming and if there's any difference at all, as well as seeing how much the presence of extra cores over the multi-threading impacts the performance that is an i3 versus an i5 chip. I'll do my best to simplify the data, but a myriad of benchmarks was necessary to get as broad a picture as possible. Feel free to pause the video whenever you need to scope the data out further. The test system was run with 16 gigabytes of RAM at 2400 MHz, and the graphics cards used were the RX 460, RX 470, and RX 480 on the AMD side, and on the Nvidia side there was the GTX 1063 and 6GB editions, GTX 1070, and GTX 1080. Starting off with the 6500's performance in Ashes of the Singularity, the most CPU bound title in my testing suite. The i5 tends to perform as well as the 6700K in all instances besides at the top of the range in DX11 at 1080p. DX12 is roughly the same but with the GTX 1070 performing roughly on par with the 8 threaded counterpart. At 1440p in DX11 and 12, it is only the GTX 1080 that hurts at all with a 14% loss in DX11, but only a 5% loss in DX12, amounting to only a 2.6 FPS difference. At 4K, the GTX 1063 gig experienced some loss, as does the GTX 1080 again in DX11, but in DX12, all of the numbers are roughly the same, even if the percentages on some of the lower cards looks a bit exaggerated. Deus Ex in DirectX 11 at 1080p shows basically no difference from the 6700K to the 6500, with the largest gap being less than 2 FPS for the GTX 1080. DirectX 12 is roughly the same with little difference in any setup. At 1440p, again no difference for any of the cards in DX11 or in DX12. At 4K in DX11, same story for everything besides the GTX 1063 gig, but again, not a difference that's impactful. DX12, no difference outside of a margin of error. In Grand Theft Auto V, every Nvidia card appears to be hindered slightly at 1080p. The 1060s are down 4 and 2 FPS respectively, but the 1070 has a 15 FPS drop and the 1080 has a 22 FPS drop. At 1440p, the top Nvidia card is the only one showing significant pullback with a 7 FPS loss. At 4K, the GTX 1080 still is down by 3 FPS, but not a significant percentage hit. Hitman again shows some pain at the higher levels in DX11 at 1080p with the RX 480, GTX 1070, and GTX 1080 all portraying noticeable losses. In DX12, the RX 480 regains its frame rate, but the 1070 and 1080 still are relatively down to a roughly 80 FPS cap here. At 1440p, DX11 only truly hinders the GTX 1080, as is also the case with DX12. 2160p loosens all restrictions with each card performing essentially the same as it would with its hyper-threaded counterpart. Metro Last Light is a breath of fresh air with each resolution showing essentially the same frame rate whether on the i5 or on the i7. In Rise of the Tomb Raider, once again we see it's only the top two NVIDIA cards that are slightly held back at 1080p in DX11, with DX12 showing somewhat of the same trend. At 1440p, the GTX 1070 is within the margin of error, but the 1080 loses about 4 FPS in DX11, 
and in DX12, all of the cards are about where they should be as with the 8-threaded counterpart. 4K, again, as was the case even with the Pentium processor, is not limited in any way, and each card lives happily ever after. Starting off with the comparison against the Core i3, the difference is staggering in some games and not in others. Without going through a ton of charts again, the basic idea is that if you're playing at 1080p, the more CPU bound titles such as Ashes of the Singularity and Grand Theft Auto show significant improvements by switching over to physical cores over just the threads, with regards to basically every GPU besides the RX 460. Other games like Deus Ex and Metro Last Light are less impacted on the general set of cards, with really only the GTX 1080 seeing an improvement by getting the better CPU. So as far as should you get an i5 over an i3 CPU, I would say yes. In my testing, it's actually better to have an i5 with a GTX 1060 6 gig over a GTX 1070 with an i3 in several games. For instance, the 1060 with an i5 gets 92 FPS in GTA 5, while the 1070 with an i3 gets 87 FPS. Now while that may be an extreme circumstance, it shows that it's something that shouldn't be overlooked. Then getting to how well the i5-6500 holds up to a top of the consumer level i7 processor. It's really roughly the same for everything that's below a GTX 1070. And even with the 1070 and 1080, it's not a huge deal. If you're saving cash on the processor to get more storage space or a better monitor, I'd likely take that trade every time. While the i5-6500 held back the GPUs, in some instances, it still was enough to put the cards in roughly the same ballpark of where they would be performing with an i7. You're not going to be experiencing much that would give you a fundamentally different experience over getting the top tier processor, unless of course your experience is completely based on bragging rights of having the highest numbers, which I, I totally get that. Now some of you may be wondering, does this apply to all i5s? How does an overclock 6600K compared to the 6700K? Is it really the lack of threads and cache that's holding the i5 back in this instance, or is it the difference of clock speeds? And to that, I say, those are some good questions, you thoughtful individual. I will be looking into them in the next video of the series. So be sure to subscribe if you want to be around when that video drops. And with that, I want to say thank you to Wootware for supporting me and supplying all of the hardware necessary to make this video series possible. If you live in South Africa, Wootware should be your go-to store for whatever your computer needs are this holiday season. With tremendous deals, fantastic customer service, and delivery to all over South Africa, Wootware wants to help you woot up your system just in time for the holidays. So if you're in South Africa, head on over to wootware.co.za to begin wooting up your life. The link is in the video description. If you found this video helpful or useful at all, be sure to hit the thumbs up button. Otherwise, make sure to hit that dislike button, but maybe also leave a comment down below to let me know how I can improve for the future. Be sure to subscribe if you're new around here and you want to stay up to date on all of my tech-related content, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Cheers.